turn to somebody real quick before we get into the word and just say, there's some things I like doing and some things I don't like doing. Just say that. Just you, You'll figure out what that means. There's just some things I like doing. Maybe it's turning to your neighbor is the one of them because some of you are just like, I'm not doing that. There's some things I like doing. You know, I think about my own life. There's some things I like doing and there's some things I don't like doing. There's some sacrifices I choose and there's some sacrifices I don't choose. Uh, Lindsay and I, between the two of us, have run a handful of marathons. And in those marathons, that takes a lot of training, a lot of, exactly, thank you very much, respect. Um, that's not why I said that, but I'll take it. Um, run a handful of marathons, but between us, if you think about it, that's a lot of hours of training, a lot of hours of preparation, a lot of hours of discipline, and early mornings, late nights. Um, and, but the thing that Lindsay and I have enjoyed doing is watching other people do marathons from the safety of our own couch recently. Uh, watching documentaries about it, watching people with, doing training vlogs about it. Like, I've just started, I really enjoy that because I like that kind of thing, and I love watching other people do it, especially in this season of life. I've got two little kids, and, and so from the safety of my chocolate chip cookies and hot cocoa on my couch, I've been watching other people run marathons. But one of those documentaries we watched, and, and I've watched it at least two times already, is called Breaking Two. And Breaking Two literally chronicles kind of the story of Elliot Kipchoge, who's one of the world's most accomplished marathoners, probably will be for a very long time. Uh, he is incredibly fast, but he was, he was hired by Nike, essentially. A couple, this is back in like 2017, to train for what they called the Breaking Two Project. And the Breaking Two Project was a, a, a kind of pro project program built by Nike, tens of millions of dollars, years and years of research and training, where Elliot Kipchoge was going to attempt to run a marathon in two hours or less, to break the two-hour barrier. Now, if you don't run, you're like, is that fast? Is that slow? Let me break it down per mile. That, what they would call that in, like, running world is freakishly fast per mile, okay? That's what, I'm not even going to get into the math. This is a fast mile. I'm willing to bet there's not one person in this room who can run as fast as that guy, now, and including myself, obviously, uh, but as, I, as we watch that documentary, one of the things that struck Lindsay and I is there's so much that goes into it. I mean, if you think about it, not only is it tens of millions of dollars on Nike's behalf, which doesn't feel like that big of a sacrifice, but it also takes hours and hours, days, even years for Kipchoge to actually get to the point where he can even attempt to run two hours, much less actually do it. And so they develop a special shoe for Kipchoge. They developed years and years of a training plan, a diet plan, a sleep plan, a running plan. Like, there is so much sacrifice that goes into it on Elliot Kipchoge's part. It's almost hard to quantify that. There are mornings that he had to wake up and run that you never thought you'd see, like there, that he maybe never thought you'd see. Hours he was putting in, strength training plans that you don't know about. All these things, all you get to see is, is the attempt on camera to break the two-hour marathon mark. Now, I'll burst the bubble if you want a spoiler alert. It's been out for a couple years. You've had your chance. But he ran two hours and 35 seconds. So he was the closest person ever breaking that two-hour mark. Um, but it's coming. That's what we know. It, it will happen in our lifetime. I am sure of it. But he was the first person to shave off some of those precious minutes in the marathon. What's incredible to me is L.A. Kipchoge chose that sacrifice. You know, just like the safety of my own couch is easier than the sacrifice of a marathon plan, think about all the other options for Elliot Kipchoge. I mean, the guy could have done anything with his life, something much safer than, than literally beating the crud out of your body to make sure you can run that fast. He had to sacrifice time with family, time with entertainment. He went to bed earlier than you probably do. He woke up earlier than you probably do. He was stricter about what he eats than you and I are. There are multiple sacrifices for, for the Kipchoge family as a whole. He's got kids, too, that you'll never see. And there's a big difference between sacrifice and safety. There's a big difference. Like, there are sacrifices, again, that we choose all the time. You may not have put them this way. But if you think about your work, some of you in the room, some of you watching online, literally there are sacrifices you are willing to make for your work that seem like they make no sense. There are commutes that you have. There are decisions that you've made. There are choices that you make about what you're going to eat, what, when you're going to wake up, how late you're going to be available on email, 
that seem ludicrous to the, to the average person. But for you, it's because you love the goal. You love pursuing the promotion. You love feeling like you're contributing to society. You love your job. You love your coworkers. So you're willing to sacrifice. It makes all the sense in the world. Uh, for your kids, if you have kids, like there are sacrifices you make that don't make sense on paper, but because you love your kids make total sense. I'm not going to get into how many bodily fluids are, have been on me this last week from my two daughters, but let me just tell you, there are things that I choose. I love them enough to sacrifice for them, and it does, it's not safe, and it's probably not even sanitary, you know? So there are things that I do because I love them. The same is true when it comes to our money. You may think, I want to get to the certain amount for retirement. I want to get to a certain amount in my savings account, and there are sacrifices you are willing to make financially that don't make sense on paper. Why? Because you value it so much. It's so important to you. Like that number, that, that goal, it's so big to you. And, and I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in 2 Samuel 6. You can turn there now. If you've got a phone or physical Bible, go to 2 Samuel 6. And we're going to start in verse 12. And I want to read this story to you. Now, on the heels of this, it's David's decision. This is Psalm 132 to build what he calls a resting place for the Lord. What is that? A couple weeks ago, we talked about David believed that at the very core of Israel's community, the very lifeblood of their community, was not good leadership, wasn't great sermons, it wasn't a bunch of money in their reserves, it wasn't a, a bustling economy. What it was, it wasn't power, what it was was the very tangible presence of God in their midst. That was the thing, the most important commitment that he could make. He pursued this as a leader. And so he does some things that, again, on paper don't make sense. He made some tangible sacrifices to see this happen. And one of those is a story we're about to read. 2 Samuel 6, verse 12. Listen to this story. This is crazy. Now, King David was told, the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. Again, this ark is a physical container for the glory of God, the, the tangible presence of God. And again, a whole other sermon series about how can a community, if you had a little box with God in it, I don't think you'd lose that box, but Israel lost the box. They lost the, the storyline here. They lost what was most important. So David goes on this hunt for the Ark of the Covenant. They find it in this guy's household. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, that's Jerusalem, with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, He sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, this is what priests or worship leaders would wear, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Let me pause there real quick. Here's what you need to catch about the very beginning of this little story. David's response to the presence of the Lord was sacrifice. I mean, tangible sacrifice. Do you know how much it would cost to sacrifice a bull and a calf every six steps? A lot. Let me save you the math. Save you the Israelite Old Testament lesson. Like, a lot of money, a lot of resource. Who gets to be the logistics guy for bringing all those on this little walk? I don't know. But who gets to be the guy that has to clean up behind this little processional of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem? We're talking like a seven, maybe eight-mile walk from the Obed-Edom household into the center of Jerusalem. That's, a, that's not a long walk, but that equals about 10,000 sacrifices on that walk. I, I don't know if you're more spiritual than me. When I read this story, here's what I see, a lot of blood and a lot of guts. That's what I see, and a lot of sacrifice. And so he, he not only sacrifices, he, he puts his own life, his own reputation on the line too. Not only has he invested... I can't even quantify, I mean, thousands of dollars in these sacrifices. He's also put on this kind of priestly garment and danced before the Lord. And it says with all of his might. Anyone ever been at a wedding where you just, maybe it's what you drank, maybe it's something else, where you went all the way dancing, you weren't like 90%, like you were just going hard? Okay, thank you very much. Someone's honest. I don't need any alcoholic help. Like, I love dancing at weddings. And if it's If the dance floor is ripe for it, I will dance with all of my might, okay? And so that's what David is doing. He literally is dancing with all of his might. I'm not going to make it awkward and show you what that looks like right now. 
But just picture if you went all in on worship earlier and you were singing, you were you're going everything 100%. That's what David is doing in the midst of this whole sacrifice and this processional into the city of Jerusalem. And so as you can imagine, listen with me in verse 16. The ark of the Lord was entering the city of David. Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord, set it in its place inside the tent David had pitched for it. And David, here it is, sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he'd finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, cake of raisins to each person and the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all people went to, the, went to their homes. Listen how this little story ends. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. It's the NIV. David said to Michael, this is his wife, by the way, if you're not putting together the pieces. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel, and I will celebrate before the Lord. That's sacrifice language. I, I will give it all. I will celebrate before the Lord. Even when it doesn't make sense to his own wife, he says, I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now, there's definitely some, like, spouse jabs going back and forth there, but you get David's point. His point is, I'm not sacrificing for you. I'm not sacrificing for your approval. I'm not sacrificing so you think more of me. I'm sacrificing to the Lord. I'm sacrificing my life in front of him. He's the only audience that I care about. And sacrifice, friends, looks irrational to those around us almost all the time. There's very few times where God calls you to do something that doesn't make sense on paper, and there's going to be someone in your life, maybe who affirms it, but it's still going to be like, why are you doing that? And why did you say that? Why are you giving that? Why did you spend your time on that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But it would have been safer to keep Israel moving ahead with business as usual in David's leadership. That would have been a safer choice. Okay, God, I made you this vow to build your resting place. I want to see your tangible, manifest presence in our midst 24-7. We're going to worship you. We're going to pray to you. We're going to sacrifice to you. But it's too hard. And it doesn't make sense. And, and my own wife is criticizing me. I guess I will just play it safe. I guess I'll just do that. But David doesn't do that. Why? He committed himself to building a resting place for the Lord. And here's, here's the idea. Sacrifice will take you where safety never can. Sacrifice will take you and your life and your family and your ministry and your volunteering and your leadership and your money and your future where safety, playing inside the box that culture or even the subculture of Christianity says is, is, is okay, it'll never take you there. You will always feel like there's more because there is more. You will always long for something more deep, more sacrificial, more costly, because that's how you were created. And safety says, don't ask prayer for that. Safety says, don't confess that. It'll wreck your reputation. Safety says, don't leave the job for the call of God. Safety says, don't sing too loud. Safety says, don't rearrange your calendar. Being extra busy is really important. Safety says, church is about me. Sacrifice says it's about God. David was responding to the presence of the Lord through sacrifice, both tangible and spiritually. One of the passages I've really gripped for the last year or so is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I feel like God just brought that back in podcasts and books and conversations with you and stories. And in that story, you, you, you know this, Jesus is, is moments before the cross, about to be sold into Roman authority, betrayed by them, sent to die this awful crucifixion death. And sacrifice himself for love, for freedom, for you and I. And Jesus prays something in the most stressful, high anxiety, high pressure moment 
of his life. What does he pray? God, not my will, but what? Yeah, your will be done. That's what he prays. That is the ultimate prayer of sacrifice and surrender and relinquishing his will to the will of God. I am so glad that the gospel story does not end with safety. It ends in sacrifice. And that's what brings it together in the end. You're like, okay, now you're sitting there, you're like, okay, I get it, man. Like, isn't this whole sacrificial thing wrapped up with Jesus? Like, sure, there's 369 references to altars and offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament. But what about in the New Testament? What about now? Like, I'm living here, Byron Center 2023. I've got air conditioning. My car starts when I push a button. Like, what, what, is, what does this have to do with my life? Like, if Jesus gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice, which is true, the Lamb of God that was slain for the sin of the world, what about now? I'm so glad that you came asking that question. Uh, because for the next minute or so, I want to walk you through at what I've been learning about this. And again, so much of this is raw and processed thoughts that you're getting in the series. But I want to take you to Romans 12, and I just want to read something. I'm not going to sit here and explain it. I just want to read something to you. And I want you to let this sink in. This is what Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Here's what it says, therefore, therefore, I urge you, like this is Paul on a knee, Please, please, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of the ultimate sacrifice already done for you on the cross, to offer your bodies as a what? Read this with me. As a, yeah, living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. Not just a bull or a calf, but your whole life, all the time, 24-7, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is a real sacrifice. Let's go to the next line. He literally says this right after. Do not conform. Because of that sacrifice, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, if I could rephrase Paul's words, if I could be so bold, I think you'd say something like, hey, let me tell you from my own experience, church in Rome, Sacrifice will take you where safety never can. Sacrifice is going to reveal things about God's will that you're never going to experience in the confines of comfortable, safe, vanilla bean Christianity. No knock on vanilla bean. You know, that's his, his point in, in, in Romans 12. That's, it, it's, it's a walkway into the will of God. And I love what Pastor Albert Tate writes about this. He says, he kind of rephrases Paul's words in Romans 12. The day of cheap worship is done. We are called to deep worship. I live in sacrifice because Jesus died in sacrifice. And when I remember what love costs Jesus, friends, it is a joy to live in a way that costs me. I love that. Sacrifice, friends, will take you where safety never can. That's why he calls it a living sacrifice. Dead things don't respond to the presence of God. Unless you're Lazarus. You know, dead th- in your life, like if you're just going through motions, if you're untouched by the Holy Spirit, if you just don't even care about growing or responding and finding out that there's more in your life, there's not going to be a response. There's not going to be a sacrifice. But that's not David's conclusion in Psalm 132 or his response in 2 Samuel 6. No, he, he tasted and saw the glory of God. He had a glimpse of what was possible. He had a glimpse of the more and the the tangible presence of God, not just saying, God, I'm so thankful that you're everywhere, but God, you want to be right here in my midst, just like in Eden. You want to walk among us again. And I'm going to respond to that through prayer, through sacrifice, and through worship. Now, here's the ironic part. Normally, this is the point in the sermon, it's 951, where I would think about how do we apply this? Or in what way can we practically live this out? And I hope that you walk out of here and you've got some practicals. I hope that you walk out and say, here's the area of life that it really hits for me. But today, I am the application. You know, for the last year, I I need to share with you just kind of a journey I've been on when it comes to exactly what we're talking about. I've shared with many of you, I think I've said this from a stage before, uh, November is a really hard month just historically for our family. I'm not sure why. Hi, Eden. Thank you very much for listening. 
not sure why, but there's been so many seasons in my life. I look back, like, man, November was really hard. And there's other seasons I look back, and I, I've told this to Lindsay recently. I was like, March always seems like a really spiritually significant month. Like, God just does things in my life and in our family in March that are really awesome things. And so it's November. I was thinking about what, what was last November like. Thank God this November has been not as hectic and psychotic, knock on wood, or like whatever this is made out of as it was. We're trying to get to Thanksgiving. But if I look back at my last November, and again, I've shared this with so many of you. It's not going to be news to you. But last November was the first time because of my master's program, Eden's diagnosis with her heart, many different things. But I, I dealt with anxiety and stress in like a physical way I've never experienced before. And part of my response uh, was, was to seek out counseling, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, in November last year, we had to leave our family's, uh, my mom and, and dad's house early because Lennon got RSV and couldn't be around the other babies. Uh, our furnace died, and it was not 50 and sunny like it's going to be today. It was a cold, cold couple days for us. Uh, we found out about Eden's heart defect, got that diagnosis. Uh, my anxiety, stress was just at a level I'd never experienced before. Just a lot of hard things last November. And one of the responses for me was to say, I need better tools. I need to make sure that, that I'm actually proactive when it comes to this thing. So much of my life in those hard seasons is reactive. Okay, this is going on. How do I react? Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not good. But one of the, the decisions we had made as a family was just to get back into a counseling rhythm. And that has been so healing and freeing for me. But one of the things that happened last November and kind of the, the, on the, in the wake of all of that was I began to ask questions about God. What are my next 10 or 15 years going to be like? What, what contribution do you want me to make in the kingdom of God? What do you have for me? And so I didn't really know what to do with that. I'd never really felt that before. And so Lindsay and I began to talk about it. Uh, me and my counselor talked about it. Fast forward to the spring, again, some of this you know, some of you went. Springtime is always the time where, as a Zero Collective, this church network we're a part of, where you work on budgets and salaries and compensation agreements and all that really fun number stuff. And so Blake and I have worked on that for the last six years together, and almost every time it's like, all right, we'll set the budget, we'll figure that out. Okay, John, here's your package. Okay, sign off, move on. And then it's like, okay, that starts June 1, is back in. It's kind of a chance for us to evaluate and re-up on our commitment to serve in the roles that we serve. And so it was like a no-brainer to me. I was like, yeah, let's do it. But this past spring was the first time I'd ever felt any restlessness about my role at the church. It's the first time I began to ask the questions, God, is, is this what you want for me in this next decade of serving you? It was the first time I've ever felt a lack of inner peace about serving as the lead pastor of this church. And I sat with that for months because it, I didn't want it to be a reaction. I didn't want it to be, oh, man, November's really hard. I'm going to decide in December to do something else and go sell houses. I don't know, whatever's easier. That's probably not easier. Sell, do something else. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Shout out to, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Touche. Um, I work at Chipotle, okay? You all know that would be easy for me. So, do something that is just less. You know, that's kind of what I thought. I was like, maybe, maybe I should just do that. And I was like, no, I definitely still feel called into ministry, God. So, so what are you saying? So I began to process all of that with Lindsay and with my boss slash pastor, Brian, who serves as like kind of leader of our church network. I began to process that in February and into March. And then it kind of got to April. And Lindsay and I really both felt a sense. And I shared this with Brian. I shared this with Blake. That this, we were felt like we didn't know for sure all the dates and the times, but we felt like we were heading into our last year of leading Center Church in this way. And I remember saying those words to Brian, and I was like, how do you get those back in your mouth? <laughs> I was like, what did I just say? At the same time, it was marked by incredible peace and confidence that this was, even though the answers for everything else were unclear, that this is where he was leading us. And even now, uh, that is way harder to say than I anticipated. And so the, the weird part about this whole timeline is, again, you wouldn't know this, maybe you would, but Brian Bloom, who's our network pastor and, again, my boss, said, hey, I'm going on a sabbatical from May to the end of August. Can you kind of sit on this for a little while? 
And I was like, um, sure, I guess. I don't know. But it was a chance for us as a family and as leadership, to, as a leadership team to just say, let's pray and discern into this to confirm that it's God's will. And his, his words to me, and he would say this, he was standing here, when I come back in September and we have our next one-on-one meeting, I, I want to hear from you. What's the story? Do you feel confirmed in this decision? Or did you just eat something weird that day and you want to take it all back? And so he came back in September, and, and again, after the summer of processing and discerning this as a family, still felt like it was God's will for us to step away from, from this specific role in ministry. So that kind of initiated further conversations within the Zero Collective leadership team, our advisory team who serves here at Center, and then even some of our staff team and volunteer leaders over these last couple of weeks. So I want to share with you kind of the initial, what does that mean? And then I want to share something else from my heart. Because some of you are like, give us the when. Give me the timeline. What's happening? And I want to give you some of that. Blake Hicks, who serves as our executive pastor for the network as well, is here. To, and he can share more of that too. But uh, that, what that means, the implication of that decision and kind of where we feel like God's leading our family, is I'll be wrapping up my role at Center Church in March in this specific capacity. And... Uh, again, I don't know the exact date. I can't give you, like, the timeline that's perfectly clean and it'll all work out. And my desire from now till that point is to help Center set up for its next season, the next leader and the next uh, assignment that God has for this church. But I want to share, because of the church world in 2023, what this is and then share what is it is not. Because you may have a 1,000 questions already, and you're like, I came for a sermon. This is not a sermon. You know, like, I came for something else. This is not what you were expecting to hear. But here's what it is. I say this from the depth of my heart and over the last year of praying and discerning this. This, as much as it is possible in our human ability, is a response and a step of obedience and sacrifice to what we think is the Lord's will for us. And I don't expect that to make sense on paper. It is certainly not the safer option, but it does feel like the sacrificial the surrendered, and the obedient. And here's what it is not. What it is not is a moral failure, a problem in our marriage, uh, a reaction to Eden's surgery and the ongoing complications with her heart, a frustration with something in our church or a conflict with someone at Center or the Zero Collective or uh, somewhere else that I just I can't resolve or a financial issue with our church or even our own family. This is unrelated, some of the challenges going on at New Life Church in Wayland. You know, what, what really hit me was I shared this with our advisory team the first week of November. And as we prayed and discerned that together, uh, something shocked me. I shared this exactly what I just shared with you to them. And one by one, three out of the six of them that were there all said, we felt like this was coming. And at first, because I'm prideful, I was like, what do you mean you felt like it was coming? My sermons are getting that bad? <laughs> like, I was like, come on, what do you mean you thought I was going to quit? And the more they shared and the more I've sat with that for a few weeks, the more it has been apparent to me that where God is leading us, he is also in parallel leading this church and our family and our congregation here. And so as they shared that, and I drove away, I was like, okay, I get what you're saying. Through times of prayer and discernment, which is what that team's primary responsibility is in this church, that is what they also sensed was, was right for Center Church. And so I want to share real quickly before I invite Blake up, just my hope for Center in this season of change. And you didn't ask for the season of change. Uh, this is something that has come out of my own life that then now affects you. But there are two words that as I prayed and tried to sought, seek the Lord on this that came to my mind. The first is unity and the second is urgency. And I want to read this right from my journal, essentially. I believe God has been doing a deep work in us, but I'm, I'm praying that in this season of change, God would bring us into an untouchable unity and internally would begin to spread externally that work to the lost and the spiritually dull in Byron Center and that we would live lives of prayer, worship, sacrifice unto Jesus, being truly experienced by every single person that lives in this community, which is the opposite of safety and it's the opposite of isolation, that we would demonstrate in our own hearts, just like I want for our family, a clear urgency for the mission that God has given us. 
unity and urgency. So I want to invite Blake up to talk some next steps, and then he'll close out our time together. Uh, you probably didn't come to church this morning expecting this. This was probably a, a surprise to some of you. Um, so I don't want to come up here uh, this morning and just go like, here's a bunch of details now, because maybe you're like me. Maybe you're a processor, and it just takes a little while to kind of absorb information, and then uh, you can come back to it. Um, so one of the things I just need you to know, though, is uh, we've been walking with John through this, uh, for a number of months now. So I think I'm a little farther down the road than maybe where you are right now. And I don't want to assume that uh, if I give you a bunch of stuff, you're going to like, oh, wow, uh, that's uh, that's a lot of information. So uh, I just want to acknowledge that, man, it's a tough it's a tough day today here at Center Church. Um, it's, it's not an easy day. I've had the privilege of working with this guy for six years now. And uh, not only that, just, I mean, we've become great, great friends. And so... Uh, I'm a little sad just like you are. You're, you're losing a pastor, and I'm kind of mourning the fact that maybe I won't see my friend as much. But we're working on that. So, <laughs> But uh, we're figuring out what that next step looks like. And so um, the beauty of being a part of a network of churches, the be beauty of being part of something bigger than just uh, Center Church itself, is that there's a team behind here that is helping and trying to work through some things. And so you need to know you're not alone, okay? You're not having to deal with this by yourself. And you're sitting there, well, who's, who's our next pastor going to be? Who, who are we going to do that? Just take a step back and just say, like, you know, that can wait for a little bit. Uh, we're in November right now. And uh, John's not leaving until March. And so we don't have a big rush on the plan. But maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, well, why are you telling us about this now? Why don't you uh, tell us about it in, like, you know, February or March when he's there? Because that's not how we do things in the Zero Collective. One of our core values is being real and vulnerable and raw. And so we leave those things up to the Lord, and this is where this time fit. And it also 